So, so far this year, we have had wonderful lectures on a wide range of topics, um, including the intersections between civilizations it, circa 1000, the year 1000, how Thucydides influenced the literature of World War I, and how human social networks support us all in interesting ways n we didn't know about. So now we're going today, we're turning our focus away from planet Earth uh, to beyond our planet and its history out toward the universe um, and emerging uh, knowledge about its dark side, as uh, we're going to hear. Um, Priya Natarajan is a professor in the departments of astronomy and physics here at Yale. She's a theoretical astrophysicist interested in cosmology, gravitational lensing, and black hole physics. I'm hoping we all understand what those words mean shortly. She is particularly interested in making dark matter maps of clusters of gal galaxies, the largest known repositories of dark matter. Priya was an under, uh, uh, has undergraduate degrees in physics and math from MIT and did her graduate work in theoretical astrophysics at the University of Cambridge. She was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for, to work at University of Colorado and the Smith, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, as well as giving many, many other lectures in a wide variety of places. Um, in addition to her re research and teaching, Priya also works um, extensively toward building gender equity in the academy and especially in the sciences. And here at Yale, that was um, through her work as a past chair of the Women's Faculty Forum and ongoing work with the WFF, and as a, board, uh, a member of the board of the EDGE Certified Foundation. Um, so Priya would be very happy if you want, wish to interrupt her with questions during her talk, and I've asked her to, to leave some time at the end for more questions. And I'll just remind you that there is a reception in the McDougall Common Room right afterwards, so you can um, and we usually have food themed by the lecture, so I'm kind of curious what kind of outer space food we're going to have today. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming Priya today for a lecture. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Thanks for that very kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk to all of you here. It's one of my first public talks at Yale. I've been here for more than 10 years, the longest that I've actually lived in any city in my entire life. Anyway, um, what I want to talk to you today uh, about um, are aspects of the universe that particularly interest me. And one of the goals of my talk is to, of course, show you why these aspects, invisible and mysterious as they are, are so exciting and how we can yet learn a lot more than one originally imagines one can, given that the structures that we are talking about are dark matter, the entities are dark matter and dark energy that don't really interact with any known substance. So the essential is invisible to the eyes, says the fox in The Little Prince. It's one of my favorite stories. And the human imagination has always been fascinated with the invisible and the unseen. So we've started in physics or in early science with ether, with miasma, which is this fluid that was supposed to cause disease, phlogiston, which is supposed to give substances the ability to burn prior to the discovery of oxygen. So these were all shown to be non-existent in the end with empirical science, right? And I'm just telling you that we have these mysterious entities whose nature we don't actually know. We know they exist, and that's part of what I want to do today, to persuade you about how dark matter and dark energy are actually different from phlogiston. Why should you believe in dark matter? In fact, more than ever, we have to believe in these very invisible forces because we have incontrovertible data. And I'm going to show you what the data is and how the quality of that data has vastly improved in the last 15 to 20 years. So it turns out that the major constituents of our universe are these two mysterious components, dark matter and dark energy. Most of the matter, more than 90% of the actual matter in our universe, is dark matter. 
And this is stuff that is not on the periodic table. So these are not ordinary atoms. And we believe that these were likely particles that were generated very early in the universe. And there are some candidates for what these particles might be. They are as yet undetected. So let me, um, as you can imagine, the, um, <coughs> I've been working in this field since my PhD in the early 2000s. And it takes a lot of people. It really does take a village to carry out one's research agenda in science. Mine is a small village compared to many other groups. I work in a small collaboration. So I just wanted to acknowledge many current and past students at Yale, uh, postdocs, and collaborators elsewhere. And also want to acknowledge um, the support that I've gotten from NASA, NSF, various foundations, and also support from Yale. In particular, I do want to give a shout out to Yale uh, High Performance Computing. Um, so what do we know about the universe? So I'll start out with a few preliminaries and uh, then launch right into unveiling the dark side of the universe for you. So the composition of the universe as we have now, the cosmic inventory that we currently have, is that dark energy constitutes about 70% of the total energy density of the universe. And dark matter, 25%, but 90% of the overall matter content. And we have a small sliver, about 4%, which is the free hydrogen and helium that was synthesized in the first three minutes right after the Big Bang. So right after, during the Big Bang, and after, when the universe was very hot and dense, but then started expanding right after the universe cooled down so rapidly that no elements beyond lithium-7 could be synthesized in the early universe. So we had to wait for the formations of the first stars to synthesize all the other heavy elements that you see here, which actually constitute a really piddly amount, 0.03%. So all the stuff that we're made of, everything came well after the free hydrogen and helium that was generated in the very early universe. So this is, where, this is where sort of our cosmic inventory stands. And you can see that the bulk of the composition, dark matter and dark energy, are unknown. We don't know their nature. And you can imagine that probably astrophysicists, and you may be right in thinking so, have a tendency to attach dark on to something that they don't really understand. It's actually worked very well. So we feel like we have a conception, even though we don't quite understand it. So briefer than the cosmic history animation that is shown to you before Big Bang Theory, for those of you who watched that show with the little nerds, um, <laughs> here is a brief graphic history of the history of the universe. So what you see here is the start with inflation. And there were very small fluctuations in the, um, generated after inflation in, in the density field, this density field is in the matter density, which is primarily dark matter. And what is shown here as um, zoom outs are actually places and times in the universe from which we actually have data. So we have data from when the universe was 400,000 years. So this, these are the photons, radiation streaming to us right after the Big Bang. And that has encountered everything else in the universe that has assembled afterward. So we are seeing the imprint. And these photons, this microwave background radiation, is detected all around us. It's uniform in the sky with very, very small fluctuations, fluctuations in one part in 10,000 10, or so. And those small fluctuations carry information about every galaxy, every cluster of galaxies, every blob of gas they have encountered on their way to us. Then, of course, with the biggest telescopes that we have now and the instrumentation and the various filters, various wavelengths beyond optical that are currently available to us, we are able to see when the first stars and galaxies assemble. So we now have data. So these are epochs where we now have data. And then, of course, the present day, when the universe is 13.7, 13.8 billion years old, we have a lot of data. We have copious amounts of data about galaxies nearby and the dark matter that's associated with galaxies and the dark matter that seems to be smeared everywhere in the universe. So before I move on to uh, showing you what the incontrovertible evidence is for dark matter, a uh, couple of preliminaries. So I just want to focus 
on some properties of light which are somewhat essential to understand uh, the arguments that I'm going to make. First, first off, when we look out into the night sky with our telescopes, be, be they on the ground or launched on satellites, we are looking back in time. So the deeper we look, the farther back we can access in time. And as time goes on, more and more of the universe becomes accessible to us. So that's what that graphic shows you. Uh, this doesn't mean that we are the center of the universe. There is no center to the universe. This is just a visualization to show you that the observable region of the universe is actually limited. It's limited by the finite speed of light and the finite age of the universe. So we can only so see so far. So a billion years later, more of the universe will come into view. So then the other concept that is going to come in handy for us is how do we actually measure the speeds of stars in galaxies. That's going to be critical in terms of the evidence for dark matter. And the way that is done is by looking at the fingerprints of stars, the stellar spectrum or spectra. And what you see there in blue and red are basically identical spectra of a galaxy. The red one is of a galaxy that is receding away from us. And the blue one is of a nearby galaxy. And so what you see, you see the same features, you see the same absorption lines from calcium, magnesium, and so on, but they are shifted. So in the laboratory frame, we know where those lines appear in terms of wavelength. And once we get photons from distant galaxies, we look at the spectrum, we look at the displacements of those lines, the broadening of those lines, we can infer the systematic motions of stars within the galaxy as well as the relative motion of that galaxy with respect to us. So that's the key. That's how we make measurements in astronomy. And these measurements of distance and of velocity have been critical to the discovery of dark matter and making a convincing case for dark matter. But of course, the most convincing evidence for dark matter comes not from the gravity of dark matter, which you can see uh, affected in motions, but from light bending. So I'll be talking a lot about light bending. And what is interesting about light bending is there's a visualization here. Suppose the geometry of our universe was the outside of a sphere. And as the universe expands, the wavelength of light actually stretches as the universe expands in time. Okay? And that's sort of what is visualized here. So um, if we put these things together, it's very, very fitting to talk about these matters this year, because it's the centennial for Einstein's publication of his paper on the theory of general relativity. And what's the fuss about general relativity? And why do we all worship Einstein so much? What's this theory of worship about? So it turns out that it's an incredibly, he had an incredibly profound insight. Okay, and the insight was that the fate, the geometry, and the contents of the universe are totally interlinked. So if we can do a cosmic inventory, and if we can figure out whether our universe is expanding, contracting, accelerating, decelerating, then we can figure out the geometry. So knowledge of any two of these constrains you. So his equations, the equations of general relativity, <coughs> couple these. And they actually, thankfully for us, they actually have only three solutions that are reasonable. So the game in observational cosmology has been to figure out which of those three solutions, three unique solutions, corresponds to our universe. Okay, which track is our universe on? But before I do that, let me just remind you that you know, in the inventory, dark matter does not emit any radiation in any wavelength. It does not interact with anything. So um, it's, it doesn't emit in the x-rays or the radio waves or the microwaves. And it just has gravity. And so it will affect motions, motions of stars and planets, and um, motions in galaxies and beyond, just as Newton revealed to us. Okay, so F equals ma. So you have a gravitating mass. You have a gravitational force that falls off as 1 over r squared. And so that's the, that's the evidence for dark matter. So the evidence for dark matter that I will first be showing you is from motions. And that's a completely Newtonian view. Okay? You didn't need Einstein for that. right? You didn't need Einstein for that interpretation. But then the other piece of evidence, which I think is more convincing, that I'll show you, needed Einstein. 
So Newton needed to be upended for that view, right? But those two lines of evidence, but you know, Newton being upended doesn't mean that our intuition about Newton's laws are wrong or they're invalid. They still have a, they have a, a regime of validity. So on, a, on, a, on scales of systems, Newton's laws are perfectly valid. It's only when we want to put out satellites and we want to have a GPS on our phone, then we need to take into account Einstein's theory of general relativity. So there are regimes of validity. And what I'm going to show you is evidence for dark matter, interestingly, in both limits, both from Newton and from Einstein. Although I principally work on Einstein's uh, constraints from Einstein's equations. OK, so these are those unique solutions, those three possibilities for our universe, depending on the contents and the geometry. So what is shown in the y-axis is the size scale of the universe, the physical size scale. And on the x-axis is time. So what you see is you have one solution. All solutions start off, expand. There's a solution that contracts back. That's a universe that will contract back. There is one that will keep coasting forever. And there's one that's b perfectly balanced just so. And guess what? That's the one that our universe, th that's the track that our universe is on. However, as we saw, the ingredients that keep that universe, our universe, just so on the just so solution are extremely peculiar. They are dark matter and dark energy. So another really nice visualization from one of my colleagues at the Space Telescope Science Institute it shows you here, again, those three fates, which if you don't like graphs, you can see in this beautiful picture that these are the three different fates for the three possible solutions. And the idea is this is time, this is cosmic time, this is past, that's the future, so this is now. And the question is, we have one universe in which we can make observations. So what can we observe now that will allow us to discriminate between these three models? And it turns out that what was observed and was actually reported the discovery of dark energy was the brightnesses of distant supernovae. These standard light bulbs, like your 60 watt light bulb, whose physics we pure understand very, very well, when they go off in distant parts of the universe, we can measure how faint they are. And we know light falls off as 1 over r squared. It turns out that these distant supernovae, standard light bulbs, were a lot fainter than just accounting, than you would accounting for the distance. So that suggested the only possibility was actually the universe was not only expanding, but the acceleration, what was accelerating, the expansion was accelerating. Then the question is, as you know from your car, if you have an acceleration, what's the gas pedal? So it turns out that gas pedal is dark energy. That's what's driving the accelerating expansion of the universe. And really, that's all we really know about it. What we do know about it is that we can parameterize it in an interesting way, uh, not necessarily a particularly insightful way in terms of figuring out what the origin is, when did dark, how did it come to be, when did it kick in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we have a way of writing it as an equation of state that kind of lulls a sort of a placeholder way of dealing with it. Anyway, let me move right along to the dark component that interests me more, and that is dark matter. So to understand what's really going on in terms of the dynamical evidence for dark matter, a la Newton, so let's train our eyes back to the solar system. So we have the sun here is the major gravitating body in the solar system. And then you have the planets lined up. And you know, I went to school when Pluto was still a planet, so Pluto is still there. <laughs> and so uh, what we have now is a plot of the speeds, the orbital speeds of the planets around the sun. And remember, the gravity of the sun dominates is the pull that holds the solar system together. And therefore, if you plot the speeds of planets, you find that Mercury is whizzing around really fast around the sun. And Uranus and Neptune are kind of lolling along on the outskirts of the solar system, partly because the force of gravity falls off as 1 over r squared. So the sun, the dominant gravity of the sun, is perceived by the inner planets. And their motions reflect that. This is great. So this is Newton. We understand it very well. We understand the orbits. So let's look at what happens when we measure the speeds of stars in galaxies. So just as we were looking at the speeds of planets in the solar system, let's look at the stars in galaxies. 
And so this is just you know, your nice little sombrero galaxy or you know, just a spiral galaxy with a lot of new young stars. And as a function of radius, we look at the speeds of stars and this is what is measured. Okay? And just to remind you, in the solar system, we see that. In a galaxy, we see that. And so this is, I mean, this is not me, the theorist, making up a little cartoon. This is real data to show you that most galaxies appear to have, these are called rotation curves, and they appear to flatten out at large radius. So what that's telling you immediately is that there isn't a dominant source of gravity sitting in the center. That model is not the model for the mass distribution of a galaxy. So what you have in galaxies is an extended distribution of unseen dark matter that holds the velocities of stars at large radii up very high, very flat. And in fact, what is shown here is a compilation of rotation curves for many nearby galaxies. Some, in some instances, the uh, measurements actually are from gas that actually orbits even further outside where you've run out of stars. So it still continues flat. So about, you know, about this distance, what you're seeing here are gas particles tracing the gravitational potential of the galaxy. So just to remind you that you know, it's a completely different model. So here's our conception. So this is our current conception of what a galaxy is. So all the stellar component, all the stars that we see in a galaxy, the entire visible galaxy in that sombrero image that is in the innermost region. What we are really seeing is the innermost region of the galaxy. However, the distribution of mass, the gravitational potential, the, the gravity of the stuff that holds the galaxy together extends well, well out. And that's the dark matter halo, which we don't see optically, but it's there because the motions of the stars suggest that it's sitting there. So that's sort of the dynamical evidence for dark matter. Now let's, so now we are sort of done with Newton. Let's move on to what Einstein. Okay, so one of the key concepts of Einstein's theory of general relativity rests on the fact that our universe, the entire universe, can be described as a four-dimensional manifold, a four-dimensional object fabric of space-time. And it's four-dimensional because it has to specify any event in the universe, you need to specify where it happened, the three coordinates x, y, z in space to localize where the event happened. But you also have to tell me when it happened, because light takes a finite amount of time to reach different parts of the universe. So for example, you all know that light from the sun takes about eight minutes to reach us, right? So if the, si if the sun shuts off, we won't know for eight minutes. And remember, the sun is our nearest star. And by just extrapolating, you can see that the starlight that I'm going to show you now in the shapes of galaxies that we're going to measure is arriving to us from galaxies, and it has taken billions of years to get here. So we don't actually know what those galaxies look like today. What we are seeing, remember, when we look out, we are looking into the past. So we are actually seeing these structures. So all the probes that we have that I'll be talking to you about, we are seeing light that left these spaces, these galaxies, these um, stars, billions of years ago. Okay? So one of the key concepts, as I said, uh, uh, Einstein's insight, was sort of the connection between mass, geometry, and fate. right? So for example, to just simplify things and to give you a feel for what the geometry part really is, is that in the presence of any kind of mass will cause a pothole in space-time. So you can think of space-time as this fabric. And remember, there's nothing above space-time. There's nothing below space-time. The universe is space-time. Okay? Uh, it's just that when we see these figures, you may think, oh, maybe you know, the universe, there's nothing there. I mean, this is, the, that would be the universe. That would be this gridded metric uh, uh, fabric of space-time. And so if you have something like the sun, it causes a little bit of a bump there. And because there's nothing above and below, light from a distant source has to travel along the bump, has to hit the pothole before it comes out to us. Now, if you had a neutron star, which is much more compact, it's a dense object, then notice it causes a sharper pothole in space-time. Of course, these are my favorite objects, black holes. 
their gravity is so intense that they actually cause a puncture in space time. Don't ask me where you go to after you go through the puncture. OK, that's a, a talk for science fiction. OK, so uh, I just wanted to motivate now that now that we have an understanding of the fabric of space time, light travels along space time. And so the deflection of light, so although Newton did not know about space, he knew about gravity. He knew that anything had mass would have an attractive force of gravity. So he uh, un, uh, so incorrectly, Newton and Laplace and Solner and all these people calculated that if you had light rays, because light at that time was believed to be corpuscles, not waves, but some kind of particle, they thought that it would get deflected, it would get focused gravitationally around objects that had mass. So they were able to calculate the deflection of light particles. It turns out that they were sort of on the right track, but they were conceptually off. They were on the right track because they were just off by a factor of two in the kind of deflections of light that they predicted. So Einstein's theory of general relativity, another reason it's a beautiful theory, is that he came up with that theory not to explain any phenomenon. This was an ab initio theory. Okay? And um, so but he predicted, one prediction of the theory is the deflection of light, the angle by which light would deflect given a mass that would cause a certain kind of pothole in space time. And so the experiment was done by the famous British astronomer Arthur Eddington uh, during an eclipse. And I'll just show you what actually, what he went and actually measured during an eclipse. So first of all, to help you visualize, this is how we conceptualize light traveling through the universe. These fuzzy little bobs are dark matter. These gray things are denote that look like nerve cells are sort of filamentary dark matter. And you'll see why. I'll show you a simulation, and you'll see why this rendering. And you can think of light as sort of these tubes that sort of from distant galaxies, the light gets bent every time you see, uh, you encounter a dark matter blob. And so here's another uh, visualization that makes it a little clear what the measurement was during an eclipse. So during a solar eclipse, when Arthur Eddington made the measurement, the Earth and the sun lined up. So you had a pretty big pothole here in space time because the sun is pretty massive compared to the Earth. And so the actual star, a star that was on the other side, when the actual star was actually located there, it appears, it appeared to be here because of the bending of light. Okay? So the light from that star gets bent. And so you would imagine that it was here. And the reason, the way you find this out, eclipse is over, lineup has gone. Pothole has moved. It has been smoothed over much more efficiently than the potholes on I-95. So you can see where the, where the original location of the star. And this angle is the deflection angle. So this angle is what Einstein predicted accurately. And this is really what established GR, one of the key observational uh, pieces that established the validity of GR definitely on the scale of the solar system. And the data and the modeling that I'm going to show you show that Einstein's theory is even valid on very large cosmic scales. This is of importance because remember, <coughs> we sort of set Newton aside by saying, well, Newton's interesting, but it works on very different scales. So what Einstein's theory has so far shown is that there's a vast range of scales over which it works. So as you can imagine, as physicists and astrophysicists, what we are really looking for is the breaking point. Where does it not work? And so a lot of the work that I'll be talking about, and a lot of what motivates me, is really trying to see where the theory does not match up the theoretical predictions and the observational data. And of course, there's the middle ground of having to model it, conceptualize the data, model it and test it against the theory, that's really what I do. That's the work that I do. So I don't actually procure the data. But what I do is I, con I look at the theory and I conceptualize it so that I can connect it to observations. I can extract information from observations that I can then use to do precision tests of the theory. And what I'm looking for is to gaps. I'm looking for gaps. I'm looking for places where the theory doesn't work. And when I end, I'll explain to you why um, that's the most exciting thing to do. <coughs> so what we're looking at is light deflections from distant sources. 
And the objects, and remember I showed you these filamentary black dark matter blobs, it turns out that just like galaxies have a dark matter halo, the, the, the objects in the universe that have the largest repositories of dark matter, even larger by proportion compared to a galaxy where I showed you the extended dark matter halo, is what is called a cluster of galaxies. So it's, it's a, uh, about a thousand galaxies that are held together by the gravitational glue of unseen dark matter, vast amounts of unseen dark matter. How do we know that? Light deflection. So these objects are, are very, very interesting cosmic lenses. So when you have dis light from distant galaxies on its way to us, gets deflected due to the presence of huge amounts of dark matter that you cannot see yet, but will be revealed to you very shortly. So you can look at the deflections. And what the deflections actually do is distort the shapes of galaxies. So you end up seeing a distorted shape of galaxies. And from, because we know what the undistorted shapes of galaxies look like, we have a prior, we can figure out all the dark matter lensing, all the light bending, all the potholes that light has uh, been transmitted through to reach us. Right? So I remember um, telling my 10-year-old nephew what I did. And so I was you know, very excited that I had this pothole analogy. And I was like, oh, you know, I, light comes in. He's like, so what, you fill potholes? That's what you do? <laughs> That's pretty boring. Why do you have to do that in New Haven? We have a lot of potholes in Delhi, so why don't you do it here? And I was like, OK, so here's the sort of the limitation of analogies. But I like that one, so I'll try not to overuse it. OK, so what we have here are clusters that act as cosmic lenses. And you know, I couldn't resist putting one equation. You know, I just had to do one. Because it's so elegant, it's so beautiful. So the deflection angle predicted by GR is proportional. So the amount of deflection that you get, you already know, is going to be proportional to the mass. Because it's going to depend on the depth of the pothole. That depends on how massive the object is. And it depends on the path, that, the path length, if you will, that light has to take. And the path length depends on the geometry, depends on all the wiggles in space time. So what's very interesting is if you can find a set of objects which have a lot of dark matter, will be big deflectors, will cause huge deflections, we can measure them, then we can simultaneously measure the mass of dark matter in those objects. Turns out it's mostly dark matter. And you get a handle on the geometry. So and of course, it is about alignment. Things have to line up to be deflected to give us uh, uh, sort of observable, measurable deflections with the instruments that we currently have. So it turns out that deflection is proportional to the mass. And the strength depends on the geometry of the universe. So you can see why I love clusters. So clusters, in one go, are giving us a handle on both the dark matter and dark energy. Right? So these are the perfect cosmological astrophysical laboratories. Because they allow you, so you, have, you can get constraints on dark energy, which is encapsulated in the geometry, and on dark matter, because the bulk of the matter that's doing the bending, even though we see the galaxies, is the unseen stuff, is actually dark matter. So this is a very nice visualization, again, to show you that you have a cluster of galaxies. And you can see the bump in space time that they've created, because they have a large, large amount of dark matter associated with them. And you see light rays bent. OK, so is this seen in the universe? It turns out that gravitational lensing by clusters is seen ubiquitously. So clusters are rare objects, but as and when we see clusters, we see a huge amount of lensing. But of course, we need the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. Thankfully, I arrived on the scene well after not only Hubble was launched, but its optics were corrected. So you know, I wouldn't have been in this field. And this field would not have happened if Hubble had not been there and its optics hadn't been corrected. So you, by eye, you can pick out all the gravitationally lensed arcs. So these are background galaxies that are sitting behind the cluster that have gotten extremely distorted in shape. And sometimes they can get so distorted, distorted that remember we saw the light rays as tubes that they can actually split into two. So you can end up seeing two images where in reality there's only one object. So the light can get so severely bent 
that it can be stretched out and it gets split into multiples. So you can see multiple copies of the same object. And we do, yeah. In the example where Einstein's theory was supported, the sun moved out of the way so you could see the actual position. But here, presumably, it's the big The key, that's the. It doesn't ever move out of the way. It doesn't move away, but. Yeah, no, but you ca I, I, did you catch me saying clusters are actually very rare. So their covering fraction on the sky is very low. So most of the patches of sky that we look at, they are not as distorted. They're very weakly distorted. So we have an idea of the prior undistorted shapes of galaxies by looking at many, many different places. That's a great question, though. Um, so here. All of these highly distorted arcs that you see are telling us there's a huge amount of matter here. There's light here, obviously, but there's a huge amount of dark matter here because look at the light bending here. Look at the shape of these arcs. OK, so let me just tell you why clusters of galaxies, which I think are the best cosmic laboratories, extraordinary cosmic laboratories, because they give you a handle into both dark energy and dark matter, this is what we know about them. They're about 1% of the mass is in galaxies, stars and galaxies that we just saw. So for example, this is a cluster seen by Hubble. All of these yellow fuzzy things are galaxies that are in the cluster. The things that are in the background are either these reddish or bluish objects. Those are the lens things that are behind the cluster. And so only 1% of the mass is in galaxies. 10% is in hot gas, which you don't see because that emits in the x-ray and we are looking at an optical image. And the rest, as I'll show you, reconstructing the dark matter map, is all dark matter. So the big open questions, right, are how much mass is there in clusters? How much dark matter is really sitting in clusters as opposed to individual galaxies in that we know because they also have dark matter halos? So in terms of the composition of the universe, how is this dark matter smeared? How is it partitioned? Then there's a big question that light and mass seem to kind of trace each other. So when I see galaxies, I see a dark matter halo associated with the galaxy. The question is, are there dark matter blobs floating around with no galaxies? We don't know yet. Okay, So we're looking for that. Because it depends on the efficiency of formation of stars. So there could be locations, dark matter clumps, that never have the right conditions to assemble stars. Okay? The theory predicts there should be a lot of them. So then we want to know how in detail how the dark matter is distributed. And this granularity of dark matter, this is a question that I have been interested from the beginning of uh, starting my work on gravitational lensing because, as I said, unraveling the nature of dark matter has been very, very difficult. But I will just show you that the granularity holds some interesting insights into its very nature. OK, and another thing in lensing that's important, like real estate, is location. So it's serendipitous alignment, right? You need it. You need, you need to be at the right place. And if you are, you could get lensed, and you could get dramatically lensed. So if you line up, that little gray blob is the dark matter distribution that could be around a cluster, smooth dark matter distribution around a cluster. So if things really line up, you could have an, a normal looking galaxy stretched out into a big circle like a ring. And that's called a, uh, an Einstein ring. Or if it, the, this mass distribution, notice this is geometrically different. This is like an ellipsoid, that's a sphere. You can have a different configuration. If things line up, you could get an image that is quadruply image that looks like this. That's an Einstein cross. But in reality, a cluster looks more like this plus this. Okay, so when you have a lot of clumpy dark matter, you get the kind of, kind of observational data that I just showed you from the Hubble image. So this is an animation. Nothing in the universe is moving, but it's just to show you the range of stretched out shapes that you can actually see. So this is a background screen where you have blue circles. Everything is a circle. So I've assumed that all galaxies form as little circles on the sky. And then I plop a huge cluster with a lot of dark matter. And the amount of dark matter is shown in the shading in the pink. So you have a lot of dark matter. It's very dense in the center, but you have a lot of it stretching out. You can see it's sort of slowly fading. So where you have a lot of dark matter, you have an extreme amount of stretching, light deflection. And as you go further out, it gets softer. But you can see that there's an alignment. Things are sort of swirling around where you have this pot of dark matter. And so what we are really trying to do, uh, and so 
me and my collaborators have been trying to do for um, several years now is to try and infer looking at the image, looking at the blue things, which would be the Hubble Space Telescope image, trying to infer what this pink stuff is. You know, what, uh, reconstruct the mass that's actually causing the deflection. So we know quite a lot about it. As I said, the theory is very well understood. It's elegant. It's simple. And basically, as I said, it depends on location. What we are seeing here is if you have a circular galaxy, distant galaxy, shown as red, blue, yellow, and green, depending on the location with respect to the lineup that we just saw in the previous slide, dep depending on that lineup, if you line up just right, like the red one, you can have four copies, four images of the same object. And how do we know it's the same object? Signature, spectral signature. You go out and take the spectrum of those four blobs, they're identical. Remember, it's a fingerprint. And the probability that any four things that lie just like that have is, is, is practically zero in the universe. So you, as a function of location, we now know all the configurations that we can look for in the data, and we can use that to map what the dark matter, what the matter is, and it's principally dark. So the other thing I want to show you in that little graphic here are these galaxies. Remember, that's our conception of a galaxy that I showed you, the little bit of starlight and a huge dark matter halo. So galaxies. So dis these are galaxies that are in the foreground. The blue blobs are distant galaxies. Notice that even if you don't have extreme stretching, you have a coherent stretch out effect. You have a distortion. You have a tangential stretching. And so we look for these signals in the data. And this is what Hubble did. This is the same patch of sky, the same cluster. Notice that you saw this arc. This is from the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And look at the resolution. You can actually resolve star-forming knots in this galaxy that's been stretched out. So Hubble has really transformed this field. And you can pick out, it allows you to pick out all these multiple images because some of them are faint. But it turns out that in general, you can think of gravitational lensing as sort of a mapping, a mathematical mapping between the source plane, distant galaxies, and the image plane, what we see. And it turns out one of the properties of this mapping is that surface brightness is preserved. So when you stretch things out, you actually magnify them. So you are not only a cosmic lens, you are a cosmic telescope. So clusters bring into view galaxies that you would never otherwise see, no matter how big a telescope you build. So they are just incredible, incredible um, beasts. OK. So for example, I just want to show you these are not just single. So there's, there's another one where you see something imaged four times. And it's this sort of spoke uh, bicycle wheel shaped galaxy. And so let's come back to uh, this cluster. So I'll first show you my sort of reconstructions and the dark matter map for this cluster. But before I do that, I would like to give you a view of what our theoretical understanding is at the moment. Let's see if the movie is starting. So what this movie is, I may have to start and stop it. Let me go back. I can't tell if it's starting. OK. Sorry. If you're getting an early preview of it should work now. OK. So what you see here is a simulation of dark matter assembly in the universe. So dark matter assembles just by gravity. Remember, there are no other forces. This is just gravitational uh, aggregation, just mocked up to look like light yellow. This is not light. This is dark matter. So you see that this is a region of the universe that's going to end up like that cluster that we saw, 2218. And what you see is a lot of little blobs, very granular, colliding. So it turns out that dark matter is actually collisionless. It doesn't actually collide. These sort of two particles kind of graze each other. They don't actually go head on like gas or they don't actually collide. That's, that's another peculiar nature of uh, what the, whatever this dark matter might be made of. So this is how a dark matter halo that is going to host a cluster of galaxies assembles in the universe. So what you see here are lots of blobs. So it's a very, very granular distribution of dark matter. So that's what the theory predicts. Okay? So this is a theoretical prediction. 
And it depends very much on the nature of dark matter. The amount of granularity that survives at later times depends on the nature of the particle. So notice this is a warm dark matter particle, which is a lot less granular, very smooth distribution. This is cold dark matter. This is the particle that we believe our universe is composed of. It's very, very granular. But you can discriminate between these two if you are able to count the blobs. Right? If you can somehow quantify the granularity from data, if you can map dark matter from lensing, if I can tell you where all the little galaxy halos are in the cluster, then I can count them up, and I can compare with the simulation that I just showed you. So that's the task that I have been interested in, and that's what I got started doing way back when. So you model the gravitational effect of the cluster, of the entire cluster of galaxies, which is mostly dark matter, as the sum of a component that's kind of a smooth, smoothly distributed component, and then a whole bunch of blobs, and lots of blobs. <coughs> so when you use the data, the Hubble data, so this is my mass reconstruction. So these are the gravitational equipotentials for this cluster. So this bright galaxy is this guy. What you see as a yellow bunny rabbit is the region within which, behind which, any galaxy that lies behind that region will get multiply imaged. We'll have five or four. Um, actually, you have an odd number of images always. So it turns out that we can then partition from the light bending that we see, we can partition how much of the dark matter should be smooth and how much should be sitting in lumps. And when you do that partitioning with the data, this is the rendition of the dark matter clumps. So you have the smooth component. You see this sort of mound. And then on top of it, you see these spikes, which are the clumps of dark matter. So the goal here is to then, so this, we've extracted the granularity of dark matter from the data, just with Einstein's predictions of light bending. Now we go to the simulation where we've put in some initial conditions for the universe that we've gleaned from other observations, nothing to do with lensing. We let the movie go, and we then look at the age at the same time in the universe where we have an image of this cluster, right? when it formed and it has assembled, and we compare the granularity. So this is just to show you. Um, so this is the kind of work that I do, trying to use theoretical concepts and ideas so that you can translate observational data to confront a theoretical model. Okay? And so this is just to show you a nicer rendition of that. Zoom in. So, yeah. No, this is a static picture. So we compare the static picture in the simulation at the redshift at the cosmic time where this object has formed, and the image that we take, which is a one-time snapshot. This, the evolution is understood by going back to the simulation and looking at clusters that are in different stages. Not the same guy, but different objects that are in various stages of growth and evolution. So this is a cluster, again, this is the one that had the five um, bicycles spoke wheels. And that's a lot of constraints. So we can actually do a really nice job. And so this is the dark matter map. So we had Hubble data out to much further than the previous case. So notice I can tell you about all the clumps out to a much larger scale. So this is, to give you an idea of scale, this is the region that is shown in yellow. So these are sort of dark map. And so it is from these kinds of maps that we have inferred that more than 90% of the total mass of a cluster is sitting in these clumps. And we can now say what fraction of the mass is sitting in clumps of different sizes. And that's a characteristic that I can derive from the data. And that's a prediction from the theory. And I can confront the theory to the data. So this is what we could do earlier. So this is from some earlier published work of mine. So these, this is the clump, the distribution of clumps. And this is the simulation. The black histogram with the gray area is comparison with clusters, with simulated clusters that form in our little box universe. And the dispersion tells you, this is from combining the data of many, many clusters. And so this, coming back to Shankar's question, these are actually chaps. These are five chaps at different stages of evolution. And we've compared them to a simulated sample at those same stages of evolution. 
Notice this guy is sort of an outlier. It's a pretty bad egg. The reason this one is so bad is that it's actually not one object, but it's actually two clusters that are merging. And they're merging exactly like this because we are more likely to find these guys because they will lens more dramatically. Right? They're lined up. They're going to, their surface mass density is very high. So they're going to bend light much more dramatically. So we are likely to pick them up. But it turns out in the simulation volume, remember we can simulate only a small volume of the universe, there isn't a beast that looks like that. So OK, so let me quickly skip on. So there are very detailed studies one can do. So this is a reconstruction of that cluster that I just showed you. In blue is the distribution of dark matter. So that's what you don't see. Okay, so there's a lot of mass sitting there, and that's just the light. This is the light and mass. And notice they do trace each other quite well. And so this is an open question, as I said, right? So as I said, I've been sort of waxing lyrical about how clusters are these amazing objects, cosmic laboratories, because we can actually get at dark energy using them. So we can calibrate the lens, which is like you know, going to an optometrist and getting your lens, your spectacles calibrated. We can calibrate a lens so that we can then measure the dependence on the distances for objects that are lensed. Doing that, so you know, for those of you who sort of know what is going on in dark energy, remember I said we parameterize it with some W, some little parameter. So these are kinds of kind of bananas that people for who do uh, say supernovae to look for dark energy. This was sort of the discovery of dark energy came out of a banana like this. So this method also gives you constraints in this plane. They're obviously not competitive at the moment. They weren't at this time. Uh, but what has changed? So what has changed? My life has changed. It's become incredibly busy, crazy, because of this new project that I was involved uh, very much in uh, sort of in, in its genesis, which is getting the Hubble Space Telescope before it dies. It may die any time in the next two to three years to look very, very deeply. Because remember, for lensing data, what we want is very, very deep data so that we can pick out all the itsy bitsy pieces that are multiple images and figure them out. Right? So the Hubble Space Telescope, we, I was part of a science working group that suggested you know, what is the most brave, optimistic, risky observation that you could do. You could stare at six pieces of sky for the equivalent of a couple of months. And so that's what's happened. So that's what's happening. What does that allow you to do? That allows you to make a dark matter map that is, has much more fidelity, much higher resolution. And this is one of those uh, regions. Another cluster, this is a cluster that was observed as part of the Hubble Frontier Fields. So notice this guy is a kind of an elongated, very uh, dramatic one. And here is the dark matter distribution. So this is clearly one of those cases where two things have smashed into each other. right? So they're very complicated, but we can resolve them. OK, then the question is, has the, has the theory moved along? So you've got higher resolution data. Do you have good enough simulations? So it turns out that they needed to be updated, seriously. And the methods, the methods that I developed over the years have all needed an upgrade. Because they are just not, they were pretty good with sparse data. But with this kind of dense sampling of data, the methods daily need serious improvement. So what have we done? What's improved? So all those histograms I showed you earlier were sitting here. So we could find clumps over a range of two orders of magnitude. With this new data, we can push and we can find many more smaller clumps. And as you saw, we want to push this, because this gives us a hint on the nature of dark matter. A lot of little blobs is what we saw. So we are putting it, we are sort of trying to push. And we've pushed. And what we see now, what you see the swath are the new simulations, the updated state of the art simulations uh, of cluster formation. And guess what? The theory looks really darn good. And as I said, you know, I always thought I could become famous by showing that the theory doesn't work, right? Didn't happen. The theory seems to work very, very well. And then I'm often asked these questions by people who read the press carefully, and they say, well, you know, there's this direct dark matter doesn't seem to be found, and they haven't detected it. And also the recent underground experiments, people have said, nope, we don't see it. So why should why should I really study? What, what am I after, right? If we can't find out what this particle is about. So before I come to my last slide, I want to show you this hot off the press image that um, the reason why I'm slightly groggy is because I was woken up this morning by BBC News to comment on this. This is a new dark matter map that was produced by the Dark Energy Collaboration. Just want to point out, this is a huge part of the sky. 
And this is a resolution, right? So my iPhone 6 is, I think, about 20 megapixels. This is 570 megapixels, enormously resolved, right? And a huge patch of the sky. So if the full moon is like half a degree across, this is two degrees or so. It's a huge amount, uh, region of sky. These dark blobs, each of these dark blobs is a cluster. I just showed you the zoom in, and I was looking at the granularity in there. So what is very intriguing about this map is that light and mass still seem to trace each other quite well, even on these scales. And this has been obtained from gravitational lensing. And now, because of the scale, right, we don't have huge distortions. We don't have all these itsy bitsy pieces. We have those slight tweaks that I showed you, those little slight stretches, changes in shape. Very systematic, statistical, enormous amount of hard work to get to this map. Because the distortions are 1% in shape, statistically. So you really have to have a lot of objects to pin that down. OK, so why look for deviations? People always ask me, OK, so dark matter is not found. Every year, someone tells you, we still haven't found it. We still haven't found it. And you're still doing this. And you're saying, oh, I'm pushing it. I'm pushing it. So what are you pushing and why? So I just want to stop with this historical anecdote that you know, when there were deviations in the orbit of Uranus from Newton's prediction right, in the 1800s, Urbain Lavoyer, who was this French astronomer, he predicted that that wobble was due to the presence of a planet. Okay, and he calculated the orbit of the planet. He predicted Neptune, and then Neptune was found. Right? And it turns out that the deviation in the orbit of Uranus from Newton's prediction, basically, he predicted it, and he said there should be another planet. It was found. Now, there's deviations in the orbit of Mercury. Okay? There were deviations. There was precession in the orbit of Mercury. And Urban Lavahie said, oh, there should be another planet between the Sun and Mercury. And he called it Vulcan. And there were people who said, you know, they found it. They didn't find it. It doesn't exist. What that needed, that, that small deviation from Newton's predictions around Mercury's orbit, the precession of the orbit, it actually needed Einstein. So the whole theory needed to be upended because of that. You know, The same explanation did not work in the two instances where you saw the deviations in the orbit. In the case of Mercury, now that you all know GR, Mercury is very close to the sun. So it's really sampling very close to the pothole, the bottom of the pothole. right? So GR becomes important. And so what we are looking for, we're looking for something that doesn't fit. Because that what doesn't fit could either be a signature of the theory needing refinement. So the existing theory, this lambda CDM, cold dark matter model, might just work if it needs a little bit of a tweak or a refinement. Or the disagreement may point to the requirement for something fundamentally new. So that's the hope. So uh, many people like me are sort of trying to figure out what the gaps are and understanding what the gaps in, translate to in terms of potential new physics. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>
Those are galaxies. Those are galaxies. So th that's a great question for this. Yeah. So these blue regions are voids as well. So you see a lot of under densities, regions where you don't even have dark matter. Even dark matter is smeared very lightly. What you saw in those pi diagrams at the CFA Redshift Survey in the 80s was actually a galaxy survey. So they were just seeing the light. And they were looking at the clustering of the light to understand what it might say about the clustering of mass that was unseen. So now we've made a quantum leap. So we can actually not only see the light, simultaneously we can reconstruct, because of this background screen from lensing, the voids in the matter distribution. And what we see is that the, the overdensities are orange and red. And you see that wherever you see dark matter overdensities, there's associated light overdensities. But intriguingly, some of these void regions, the blue regions where there's very little dark matter, you are seeing an occasional uh, galaxy cluster or so. So this is, you know, this is just from, I think, 5% of their data. So it remains to be seen how, um, what kind of view we get as time goes on. Here. No. Oh, you so the question you is: Are the, our measurements of the anisotropy in this cosmic microwave background, you know, that map that I showed you in the f sort of first couple of slides, where it carries the imprint of everything that is encountered? The photons carry that imprint. So there you're looking at temperature fluctuations of one part in 10 to the minus 5. So what you're looking here at, I don't know I told you, is, uh, is one part in 100. So 1% change in shape, roughly that kind of fidelity of what we are mapping. So they're not quite there, but they're in agreement. This is what is intriguing. Because from that, from the cosmic microwave background, we can predict the number of clumpy things that these photons have encountered. And we can create a power spectrum, as you know, Joel. We can make this power spectrum. And that power spectrum is the power spectrum that matches what we see, even on very, very large scales, like in this new map that was released. So there is concordance, sadly. <laughs> There's still concordance. Mm -hmm. matter density. We're looking at the surface mass density. You're actually looking at the projected 2D surface mass density. We're not looking, we're not mapping the stress energy tensor. You're absolutely right that we have to make another sort of leap uh, on the nature of this beast, which is why we think it's a cold, dark matter. It's a sort of the sluggish set of particles that don't travel very fast. And we create, it's like an ideal fluid. It's actually a peculiar ideal fluid. It's a pressureless fluid. That's what this cold dark matter is. Yeah. Cliff, you have another question? Oh. A political question, maybe. Why are we letting Hubble die? Well, I think the next generation, uh, we need to open the window in other wavelengths. So for example, the mid-infrared, far-infrared, and the infrared parts of the spectrum, we've only started developing the detectors that are sensitive in the infrared. So we need to open these new windows into the universe. And um, so the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, hey, I want all, you know, I want all the telescopes to be on all the time. I want lots of grant money for theory and big computers. I want it all, right? But um, the astronomy community has kind of made the decision that they need to, you know, have a set of facilities that are phased in and phased out so the money can go, the limited budget, sadly, can be uh, channeled appropriately. So you made a transition from dark matter. This is a very simple question, probably very nice. It seems like you made a transition from dark matter to dark energy at some point. Are they, they're not the same thing. Are they both have a gravitational effect? Well. Because I'm not mm. confused because at one point I thought I was hearing a lot about dark matter and the lensing it was doing. And now I'm looking at a dark no, 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 but th this, th this is still dark matter. Okay. Um, the survey eventually hopes to get a handle at dark energy. So this That's is a tape. This should really say dark matter on the 
Yeah, uh, no, no, that's the name of the survey of the group of collaboration that's produced this oh, data. Okay. If you want to go and look more today, so you should go look at that survey. Yeah, no, no, uh, that's, yeah. Th well, they were after dark energy, but dark matter came for free for what they want to do. <laughs> but I'm more interested in the dark matter, and it's a so dark this matter. Is about dark this matter. is about dark oh, matter. Okay. Their survey has more ambitious goals on doing, <laughs> remember that rulers that I was telling you. I'm really glad, because otherwise, yeah. One moment, please. A lot of uncertainty about that. Um, so the question is, what do we know about dark matter locally, right? So that we think that it's very sparsely distributed around the solar system. There's not a whole lot. And how much, it, how it tapers and how it falls off in the vicinity of the solar system is debated. And we think that one of the reasons that you don't see any detections is because we have it completely off on what the flux should be locally. But we think it has to be quite low because we have the sensitivities of many, many instruments now that have put limits on what it should be nearby. Okay, follow up back there. This is related to the previous question. I think you mentioned in the beginning that dark energy is what basically keeps the universe uh, from collapsing. Yeah. But other than that, more about it? Yeah, more about dark energy that <coughs> makes it different from dark matter, especially in terms of uh, you know, its interactions with gravity. I mean, no, no, exactly. It's, so the, the question is, how, how are, could dark matter and, um, and dark energy be related in some way? So they're actually the opposite of each other, right? So dark matter actually coagulates gravity, attractive. Dark energy somehow pushes everything apart because it's powering the accelerating expansion of the universe. So while dark matter will tend to bring things together, dark energy pulls them apart. And this is reflected as it, we don't know what it is. The only thing we know is that we have measured what we think this uh, contribution to the overall cosmic inventory is from dark energy, and that is 70%. So the dark energy, the way I told you those bananas that are used to figure out what it is, um, it, it is consistent in physics with the vacuum energy uh, of the universe. However, the theoretical uh, expectation for that number is off by 120 orders of magnitude <laughs> from what is measured. So I mean, it would be fair to say the problem is not solved. I mean, we really <laughs> don't, we don't know what it is at all. Okay, one more question and then we'll retire to the reception, so right here. Probably one of the very, very blue areas here, yeah. I would think. So our solar system would be a little bit blue area? Yeah, would have the kind of density. It's not here, because right. these are not, yeah. these are maps. Blue area yeah, so blue. something like that, actually quite, uh, quite blue, quite devoid. That's what the direct deter uh, the detection experimental limits are suggesting, mm -hmm. that, the, that the dark matter density is so low, it's below the sensitivity of all the instruments at this point, which is why we haven't detected it. So I think it would be fair to say, um, I don't know the calibration of this, but I mean, something like that, that you know, it would be very, very low. OK, well, thank you so much for expanding our horizons <laughs> dramatically today. Thank you so much thank for the lovely questions. Much. Thank you.